Vincent Fraud, that uh, Peter Fraud, the chief economist of the ECB, uh, is with us. Uh, he has uh, been, uh, and he still is for some time, uh, the very influential member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. Before that, he had been um, an executive director of the National Bank of uh, Belgium. Uh, and uh, <coughs> he had uh, been also responsible in the committee of, of the Belgian Banking Finance Insurance Commission. Uh, I have uh, to say we are not only friends, but also neighbors, <laughs> because uh, at the ECB we sit around the table according to alphabet. And uh, so <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> N, <laughs> N and P are close together. And that makes uh, uh, gives us a chance to have a bit of our own discussions, uh, uh, commenting the official discussion. <laughs> and uh, Peter is uh, somebody who is uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable, both about the theoretical side, he's also serving as a professor in Belgium, and about the policy side. He had played a very important uh, role in solving bank crisis, and you know Belgium had uh, enough of bank crisis in the recent uh, in the recent years, and uh, so I have to say <coughs> at the ECB, uh, when uh, Peter speaks, everybody listens, and I'm sure this will be the case also now. Peter, the floor is yours. <laughs> Everybody is drunk, no? <laughs> Maybe it's a training for my next career, you know. Before I joined central banking 20 years ago, I was doing a lot of uh, dinner speeches, lunch speeches, and when I was working for a bank, yeah, Stefan, you do that now, you know. <laughs> you know what it is. Many of you know that. And uh, so, so... Five minutes, maybe five minutes. What would I say in five minutes? Uh, first, I, the first thing I saw this morning when I prepared, uh, I looked at the um, surveys about uh, the euro. So there is a very high public support for the euro, which is good news, uh, everywhere, including Germany, <laughs> including Austria, a bit lesser in, uh, in Italy, uh, but still very high. <laughs> On the other hand, if you go to the other question, which is trust, uh, then it's very low, actually. And so there is a contrast between people say we love the euro, uh, but we have some you know, doubts about uh, the question of trust vis-a-vis -vis the institutions that manages the euro. So I wanted to just mention that here. I think this is a question we have to, as uh, policymakers in general, that we have to take you know, <laughs> very seriously. It is, so the first answer to that is to say, well, this is just a survey. And um, it's also the case for many institutions, public, private, uh, non-public. Uh, non I mean, think about church, trust in church. You know, I mean, these sort of questions you also have. So the erosion of trust, and I think, Martin, you wrote on these sort of issues very much in your book. I think it's a key issue. And uh, you cannot say this is a general thing, so we are only one piece of a, problem, of a problem. No, I think each of these institutions, key institutions in our societies, have to see how do we react to this? How can we regain trust in, so I take it very serious. That's my first point. And uh, now, uh, the, the other point, when you go a little bit more in the details about the trust you know, in institutions, uh, you see, uh, unfortunately, a divide. Uh, in the introduction to uh, this dinner, and when you got your honorarium uh, um, member of SWEF, you said SWEF is good because it puts together <laughs> academics, <laughs> private sector, and uh, central bankers. Well, <laughs> where, is, where is the rest? Where is the rest of the population, actually? <laughs> And uh, so I, I wanted to link, you know, my, my first observation with that. And actually, it, it brings together the elite, uh, as we, I quote, of course, because I, uh, what is the elite, of course? Huh? We understand what people think. But I think it's a serious thing. And so 
So there is also, in, when you look at these questions about trust, you'll see really the divide, the divide how people trust institutions. The more, and I would like to say that, that it's the more educated, the more elite, the more you trust the institutions, <laughs> in a way, of course. And if the lower you are, and that's the mass, the lesser you trust these institutions. So what do you do about it? I mean, first, how do you analyze? At first, you could say, well, it's, it's linked to the business cycle. Uh, yes, because in up to 2007, it was quite high, actually, the level of trust, and then it went down very much. It improved, so people say, with the economy, it improves. Uh, so that's one sort of answer. The second, uh, which is more serious, of course, is that uh, the elite, when we put the uh, euro together, but not only the euro, but the system in general, there was uh, high expectations about all the goodies that the system would bring. Uh, I don't like to mention that, but I, when you look back, one currency, one money, what was written at that time by the Commission, uh, it was uh, things like current account imbalances would not matter anymore in the monetary union, like current account imbalances do not matter in the United States, for example. These sort of things were written. Also, the, um, so there were a lot of things which were said at that time, and then we had, you know, 10 years, you know, of a, we had this big financial crisis, of course, and of course, no wonder, of course, that you know, trust in institution has been eroded very much, has changed very much. The, uh, also, another issue, which is more central banking here, is that the ECB has been on the front line in uh, responding to the crisis, of course. And then the headlines, newspapers, the whatever it takes, of course, was key, instrumental in bringing trust back, you know, of, uh, I would say, Wall Street and probably Main Street, but at the same time, it gave the impression that uh, these institutions had enormous amount of power. Uh, and I refer to all the discussions about unelected powers, you know, and, and the central bank being having maybe more power uh, in terms of perceptions in the population than what really it has, actually. And so also the, the involvement of the ECB uh, in the Troika and uh, in uh, just giving a hand to the Commission and the other institutions also, you know, uh, led the public to say, well, this institution is a political institution, is involved in politics, in policy makers, well beyond the strict monetary, monetary mandate, of course. Of course, we know, we know, I never participated to Troika missions, for example. I was one in Spain, which was a financial uh, support, you know, a very specific uh, um, uh, assistance program. Uh, but I always, always thought it was uh, very dangerous for the institutions. But there was very difficult vid not to do that. I think in communication, when I saw some of my staff members, and I, I speak here very openly still, being in function, being on, on, on prime TV, you know, on uh, prime photos in, in the Wall Street Journal with the IMF, being on pictures, for example, uh, in Greece, getting out of a hotel, you know, and, and discussing a, a program. Always thought, and I'm not, I'm not alone uh, to have thought about this uh, in the board, was not good for the institution because it would expose you uh, to, as a, as a, uh, to the public by saying this is a political institution. So we are very careful now to support, you know, all the deepening of the union to deal with, you know, uh, crisis uh, management and all that. So we are in a liaison, and even when you are in liaison with the commission, we want to put it as narrow as possible uh, in the framework of our, you know, mandate and not going into things like what we think is good in social security reforms in some countries, because that's not a field of expertise. You know that, Rival, and we discussed that in the governing council very much. And, but it was very difficult, it's easy for me to say, ah, I didn't participate to missions and all that, that's very comfortable because uh, Asmussen and other people in the board have to do that, that's comfortable, of course. But I had the privilege not to, to do that because I thought it was not a good thing to do for that institution, but we had to do it anyway, so we do it the best we could, but, uh, and then we build institutions after. Uh, the other thing uh, which is even, um, I think, more serious is that uh, when you reach the lower bound, and you have to use the balance sheet capacity of the central bank. It also opened a new door of exposure of the central bank in the public, of course, because people start to think, ah, you know, when you move interest rates, people somehow understand, you know, that low interest rates can stimulate the purchase of houses and things like this. But it's indirect sort of transmission. When you, when you go into purchases uh, assets somehow, the temptation comes very quickly, you know, to do, ah, why don't you do that for <laughs> green finance? Why don't you do that for this? Why don't you do that for that? 
And so it is true that the zero lower bound, which I think uh, had uh, uh, the limit or the, the effective lower bound, as we call it, uh, uh, we were very conscious of that in the ECB. Some people say you were too late compared to the United States, for example, in going there. But it was very, uh, eval very well reflected, you know, once you go into that, because you knew, I mean, I knew certainly, when you go into that, you open a new door. I think it's important in monetary policy to use QE, but I also understand that the general public, uh, it's not only the informed public, but the general public at some point will think, you know, why not using all that trillions that you create, you know, just to give it to the people. And I vaguely refer to the modern, what is called the modern monetary uh, theory, of course, monetary theory, where people say, well, not using central bank, you know, for the ecological transition. And, you know, so you get into these sort of, of things uh, which are very worrisome for central banks. So, and the last thing also uh, is that when the central bank was uh, got res uh, supervision responsibility, I was in supervision, as you mentioned, very much involved in the uh, crisis of uh, major institution in my country. Uh, we know, I mean, every you also, you know, very uh, know uh, Eval pretty much about uh, what a, uh, a banking crisis means in political terms, in legal terms. You know, discussing ownership rights and the exposure you have in these sort of of situations. I knew that, uh, and of course, uh, as you know, <laughs> the ECB got also this responsibility. And it's true that uh, I uh, always personally felt uncomfortable in my mandate of eight years because when I signed uh, my contract, actually, I never saw anything about uh, supervision responsibilities. It was a very simple contract, price stability, uh, and that was it. Now, we have this uh, separation uh, principle which tries to accommodate, you know, a little bit this issue of, you know, monetary policy which uh, has a high degree of independence, and when you deal with property rights, obviously, uh, it's a difference. It's a different ballgame. It's not the same, of course. Uh, so uh, we try to do the best of that, but I think reflections on this are needed in the future. I mean, it's um, so that's for my first point. I mean, uh, so it's uh, well, it's not been easy always. Uh, the second, the second thing is a little bit the worry we have, and uh, I'm happy you're there, Martin. Um, remember a WP3 uh, speech you made, lunch speech you made, which was fantastic, actually, and, uh, uh, well, including populists, but uh, Europe tend to forget, you know, it's composed of small, small economies, uh, small economies. I mean, Germany, uh, UK, these are small economies in the world. And uh, prosperity depends of openness. But openness, of course, doesn't necessarily lead to prosperity. Uh, openness leads to prosperity only if you have a framework <laughs> which is negotiated. And I used to teach many, many years, you know, European integration. Uh, and uh, and in, how do you explain European integration? Well, you start, you know, with comparative advantages, small low, uh, open economies, so you have to have a framework, competition law. How do you protect ownership rights? You know, how do you deal with disputes, you know? between creditors, debtors, you know, how do you deal with conflicts internationally? So openness is very good, but provided you can bring institutions that respond, you know, that, that puts some order, you know, in, in that. And so the idea was that when you, when you go into European integration, you do it with countries with relatively, you know, similar culture, economic cultures. You put them, you bring them together, and then you can go faster than what you could do internationally. Uh, you would, uh, so, because internationally you have too many differences, of course, comparative advantage means ah, you get more from international trade than from intra-European trade because you are uh, more similar. But on the other hand, internationally the shocks would be much bigger, of course, than intra-trade. And you can also develop institutions, learn about institutions. And that was a very great experience, as we explained, as I explained to many students over the years. It was a great experience that would be a, a step, you know, towards you know, a, an orderly globalization process. And, uh, and so that was a little bit how we taught to the students these things. And um, so we had, you remember, intra-industry trade, ex, uh, and uh, you, know, uh, you trade, you, you exchange cars against cars, you, know, you get uh, product differentiation compared to the classical theory of comparative advantage. So we have these, these sort of things. Moreover, when you, when you, you develop uh, institutions uh, in Europe, that would be, <coughs> and you, you agree on that, you can, of course, have bargaining power outside 
of the Union. So you, you help in designing global institutions, WTO, GATT at the time, institutions. And you remember the most favored nation clause is a key, is a key principle in all that setting. And so these small open economies, they go together, they go in uh, here, and then they have a foreign trade policy and they can defend you know, uh, their interest in the global setting in the GATT and then WTO. That was uh, the thing. There have been big shocks, there have been China, and there have been the enlargement. Uh, I had some friends like André Sapir and people at that, that time. The enlargement was absolutely key, was to stabilize also, to bring you know, con real convergence to these countries very quickly. I think it was a big success. Uh, the distributional consequences have not always been well managed in some countries, and then you get a, a setback you know, at some point. Uh, and uh, so you see that a little bit with, uh, with the British. Uh, and, uh, but it was absolutely necessary. The other one was China, of course, which was the other big shock. And uh, the distributional consequences have been neglected, frankly. And then we, we, pay, we pay a little bit the consequences of that. The uh, single currency, I'm almost finished, the single currency was actually, we tend to forget it, but it was a response to world monetary disorder and to currency crisis we had in Europe. I mean, we, all the people, we remember very much, you know, I remember very much the... Uh, uh, currency crisis, you know, in Italy. I remember um, I was, um, Jean-Pierre, uh, we were next to uh, Woodstock, which was my <laughs> generation when I was young. Uh, next to you, Woodstock, I debated with Savona, uh, the uh, Italian uh, ec Minister of Economy who is now, you know, joining CONSOB. Uh, and uh, he was arguing that uh, Italy was doing well as long, it's on the website, it's on YouTube, so it's not uh, something new that I say, it was uh, open. And I said, you know, um, uh, well, he, he was arguing that uh, as long as Italy had the exchange rate, uh, you know, possibility to devalue or whatever, to change the exchange rate, Italy was doing well. It's when Italy was pecked, you know, in an exchange rate regime, also under Mussolini, uh, that uh, there was a problem for the economy. That was the, the point. The question about uh, the interest rate, you know, it works at some times, but not always, because markets learn, and then you pay risk premium, you have interest rates well above 20%, but also real rates extremely high. Uh, these these uh, circumstances are forgotten by many people today. So when we entered this whole project about monetary union, it was also uh, because we had all these disorders and the internal market was ready to collapse. Now, what I think myself also co seeing this all debates, the first one, the previous one, and, and that one on the currency coming back is very worrisome, of course. I have the impression I'm 40 years, 50 years back, you know, trying to explain to students again what was <laughs> things which I thought were well understood. Uh, we have to start again, you know, telling people, you know, that the world, you know, needs to have... Uh, the world is not a is not a, 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 a simple environment, you know, where everybody is nice. And uh, so, on on the on the exchange rate, this uh, this nostalgia that you find sometimes about the exchange rate, I think, is very worrisome. Uh, of course, some people say that if you have good uh, monetary policy, you can, uh, like in Poland, I hear that, for example, you have good monetary policy, you have inflation targeting and whatever, so you can get both. You can get uh, exchange rate flexibility. And at the same time, uh, you have a relatively uh, stable, low interest rate, a stable environment. So you have the optionality. Think about Sweden, think about Denmark, think about the number of these countries. To some extent, it's possible, of course, but life is not so easy. What I think is probably more deep in, in this nostalgia of the exchange rate is the regret that inflation is not going to bail out you know, some of the uh, excessive uh, indebted uh, countries in general. And as you know, that uh, in the history of uh, Reinhard Rogoff, for example, you see very often this, this question about uh, if you have a debt legacy, you know, inflation is one of the way to bail you out, you know, to get out in the short term because you pay the price later in terms of credibility and all that. But I mean, that's one option that has disappeared, uh, especially in the union. And so there is a little bit of link between this nostalgia for the exchange rate and uh, the uh, inflation as a way to bail you out from, from a, an excessive debt situation outside of the parliamentary uh, sort of uh, process that you have, you know. So uh, I, I think this debate on the exchange rate, uh, but as I say, I mean, people like the euro, uh, which, is, which, is <laughs> which is still uh, a very big asset. We responded, the, the next one was the financial crisis, which was not uh, predicted when 
the, uh, when we designed the Euro area, because we didn't give supervision uh, sufficient attention, I think. There was the idea that uh, capital movements would always be stabilizing, not destabilizing, etc. You know what happened. And we brought a number of answers to that. I think uh, that's, I think, very encouraging uh, that we do that. Now, the system has not been tested yet, and the system is not yet complete. Uh, we have very big difficulties, I will stop with that, with the banking union. We have very big difficulties in the banking union in finishing, and even in trying to explain to bankers in general, the bankers here, what will be the steady state in the banking union. Or we say, yes, it will be in 25 years or something like this. I'm not talking about the deposit uh, guarantee schemes, but I'm just talking about the fact that banks would be able at some point to operate like they do on their domestic markets. And we know, we know that it is essential for private risk sharing purposes to have uh, that sort of environment in which we not have, not, not necessarily pan-European banks. I think it's needed to have pan-European banks. But we need to have uh, at least very diversified liability sides of the banks. You, because banks can on the asset side be very concentrated on the local economy. If there is a local shock, what will be the disaster or not for the local economy? or for the government. Well, if the owners of the bank, plus the bondholders, the bailable bondholders, will be internationally diversified, because basically in the portfolio of asset managers worldwide, or even the European Union, and if your banking resolution process, the bail-in process, is well done, I mean, uh, you don't necessarily need to have pan-European banks, because each bank can be concentrated in a country, but if the liability side is sufficiently diversified for what is bailable in the BRD, for example, that would be okay. So you need, of course, a lot of diversity. You need pan-European banks, I'm convinced of that, just on the assets and the liability side. Uh, but it's not just the funny dream to have pan-European banks, you know, just blossoming uh, in the union. I think there are uh, many solutions. That's the link with the capital market union, I think, which is essential also. And we are very far, unfortunately, from that. So the system has not been tested yet. I think the financial system remains extremely pro-cyclical. It's possible that the banks will be lesser pro-cyclical in the upswing of the cycle, so will not be as exuberant as we had previously. In the downturn of the cycle, I think the banks are going to be very pro-cyclical if the downturn will happen again. They will be very pro-cyclical because they have weak profitability and they, want, they don't want to go through what they lived you know, 10 years ago. And so the system, I think, remains quite pro-cyclical today in spite of what we have done. And so this question of banking union, people say, ah, yes, you talk about banking union continuously. I think it's a top priority. I'm not saying that we should complete it in, in one year, in one go. But I think it's amazing that we don't have a horizon which is uh, strategically relevant for banks, you know, uh, that we could say in, let's say, five years, you know, this is the environment in which you are going to work. Uh, and uh, it's still not the case today. So, so the, among the eval, uh, I'm going to stop here. But among the other topics, there is the real convergence with, um, within the, the European Union, which is not very, uh, very uh, visible. At least there is more convergence from the non-Euro area members than within the Euro area members. There is also a number of questions about monetary policy. I know you are going to <laughs> ask me questions about this. Uh, and just I leave it for the conversation. I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this, uh, I think, very innovative uh, perspectives that you brought up. So the idea of, uh, is that uh, the two of us have a bit of a conversation. In the interest of time, I will limit myself to two questions, and then we have also a chance uh, for Q&A. And uh, it should not last uh, longer than midnight. Uh, so uh, <coughs> perhaps, uh, Peter, I think this was quite uh, uh, rather rare for a central banker to reflect about this uh, perspective uh, of we as the elite uh, and what kind of trust can we have. And uh, I see this in the context of our notion of an independent central bank, mm -hmm. which is, of course, a core notion for central bankers. The way how we interpret this usually is independence vis-a-vis -vis the government, vis-a-vis -vis the state. When I came to the central bank 
11 years ago, in my first speech uh, to my staff, I said, we have to be careful that we are not only independent vis-a-vis -vis the state, but also independent vis-a-vis -vis interest groups. And the most relevant interest group for us is the banking sector. So maybe it is a fact that uh, uh, we are in some way, uh, of course, this is uh, our, ma <laughs> our main uh, partner, but uh, frankly speaking, if you think about uh, uh, our agenda at the ECB, we have many uh, meetings with the banking industry. We will have one next week again uh, with financing industry. We have no meetings with some associations of consumers. We have no meetings with trade unions. We at the Austrian Central Bank for quite some time, we have a supervisory board uh, where we always had traditionally uh, members of trade unions, uh, delegates of trade unions on board. <laughs> Our present government eliminated this. We have no, no voice of trade unions at all uh, in this advisory uh, part. And maybe it is also that, uh, and you know, in our meetings, we have a long discussion. What is uh, the perspective, the expectations of the markets? <laughs> in some way, it's rather simple. A, a stock exchange always wants low interest rates. So the markets always want low interest rates. Uh, so perhaps uh, it, is bit, uh, it might be a bit of a problem to follow too closely the perspectives and the demands of markets. Would you comment on this? Yes. Um, it's true that uh, the transmission of monetary policy is, uh, goes very much via financial conditions in general. In general. So we communicate, uh, central bank communicates, sends a message. And uh, then you look at uh, the reaction of markets in general, this interest rate, the whole curve, asset prices, and that influences behavior in general. So there's a, that's a transmission chain. There is another one which uh, goes via the public, of course. It's this trust, you know, in, in the environment in which it is. But I think the, the, the first thing for a central banker is uh, that when you look at these questions about trust, uh, there is another question about what is the central bank doing? What is the central bank? What is the mandate, actually? And even if you have the question, what, what is your perception about prices, about inflation? You see that the level of knowledge is it's, it's, it's quite low, usually, and about uh, central banks. So I think the first thing the central bank should do uh, is, uh, is uh, well, I mean, this is a big reflection in the Bank of England, for example, we have that too, uh, is uh, how do you communicate with the public? I mean, I think the, the basic principles of sound money are uh, over history are very stable actually the basic principle is a very very i mean it's, it's a very simple story if you look at i mean you look at history of money in general it's always it's, it's very constant it's always the same question and and everybody teaching you know money and banking you will start you know with the division of labor you know the unit of account the store of value and all these things, you will tell the students all these things. And it's over the years, you know, how do you organize division of labor, of labor worldwide? How do you go into all this very complex economy that we have? And so money uh, is quite a, a key uh, instrument that reduces transaction costs, cre creates, it's based on trust and all that. So it's very easy, I think, to explain that to the public in general, how you can debase currencies, you know, how uh, you can mismanage a currency. I think we, we lost that a little bit over the years, I think, and, and we have to come back with that. The question I mentioned with uh, QE and uh, the, the lower bond makes it very complicated, I think, and makes a big risk for central banks now in the future uh, that you deal in an environment with very low interest rates in the future where the main instruments is you use the balance sheet capacity because you balance sheet cap creation money directly and you buy assets on you buy assets directly on markets, of course, leads to a lot of uh, temptations, you know, from, from a, any politicians to say, ah, you should buy that class of active. Uh, we in, in Europe, we have this uh, no uh, monetary finance of government, uh, which is in the treaty, protects us very much. So everything we do in QE has to be justified by a monetary policy case. But uh, the interpretation by populists today eh, is goes beyond that. Eh? You know the debate, I'm not going to. 
So I think, yes, we should do more. I think it's more urgent that usually we, we say. I think, for example, the national central banks. I mean, if you look at Europe, I think the national central banks have a key role to play. They will say, ah, where's well, the national central bank's uh, role, you know, uh, when you have a single monetary policy? Well, one way is to explain to the public what we do. Uh, I may add that we as the Austrian central bank, but also, of course, all the other national central banks, we invest increasing amounts of money in uh, what we call financial education. So, and we do this not only at the university level, but we really start with kindergarten, uh, where we have a bus going around uh, uh, Austria. And uh, so uh, I think it is something that uh, we are very much aware. But of course, this is all we, all we always reach only some small part of the population. May I, may I uh, switch to another uh, part of the discussion? We, the, the whole, our whole conference series about 20 years of Euro. After 20 years, I think uh, it might be a good time to rethink some of our basic assumptions, uh, to start something like a kind of a strategic review we see that some central banks have started this. For instance, the Fed is just uh, in the starting phase. And uh, it might be quite interesting for the ECB also and for the chief economist of the ECB to think about this issue. Could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the, the Sintra, you know, conference in Sintra will deal with 20 years euro. And so uh, I suppose uh, that uh, that sort of issue will, will come in the discussions, I guess, about, you know, taking a long-term perspective and, and making a sort of assessment, making a, uh, uh, making a sort of assessment about uh, how, how the framework has functioned. I, I, I think personally, um, one has to be careful about the words one use. When you say strategic review, uh, you may signal that the policy didn't work, <laughs> the present strategy didn't work. Uh, that's why you want to review, because if you want to review, uh, you may think that uh, the strategy doesn't work. Uh, so in terms of signaling, that's the f my first reaction was always be careful before using these big words. I looked at the two, and I will, I will uh, introduce the topic in Sintra in uh, June, I already now. I will have left the ECB, but I will introduce the topic. But when you look at the strategic review of 2003, well, I mean, uh, I mean, frankly, I mean, is it a revolution, the strategic rev uh, review of 2003? I read it sometimes a clarification about the objective. Uh, it's below but close to 2%. It's the role of the first pillar compared to the second pillar. The first became the second. I mean, I can, I can just say that one has to be careful about the words you use and the signal you send to the market. So I say, let's think carefully. Uh, what signal do you want to send to the markets and where does it lead to? Well, fundamentally, you can say a strategic review is needed because, uh, I don't know, let's say financial stability issues, you know, uh, are too little present, you know, in the present framework. How could you better integrate financial stability in the normal monetary policy decision-making process? We look very much about transmission via the banking system, so financial stability to some extent is there, but it's not explicitly uh, really uh, in the governing council decision on, on discussions on monetary policy where you have a, another voice which will be financial stability, uh, developing a financial stability argumentation and then you get a, money, a pure traditional sort of tailor rule sort of uh, presentation. You don't have that in the board. We have an underlying. The Fed doesn't have that either. The Fed uh, staff refers uh, to financial stability work, which is being done by another DG, by another department, uh, but it's not directly in the deliberation. So that's, you could say, ah, that's something that could come in. How do you make these sort of trade-offs? We have a medium-term framework where normally we, we, we take that into account implicitly, but you could say, well, maybe you should do it more explicitly uh, in the monetary policy deliberation. That's a possibility. Uh, but don't forget, at, at the end of the day, your mandate is price stability. Do you have to change the price stability? So price stability is not enough. Should you uh, go one step further and go into the mandate by saying it's not only price stability, 
it's financial stability and price stability. I would really warn before you go into these things to think very carefully. What we say is sustainable price stability. So sustainable, if you think it's, uh, you get price stability in the medium term, but you have growing imbalances, I would not qualify it as a successful policy. So we do that actually, we should do it better perhaps, but we do that actually. Uh, so I, I would just say that strategic review, what does it mean? There is another point with a strategic review, it's linked to the instrument, is to say, well, because you go into the effective lower bound, uh, there may be uh, reasons to rethink the strategy. The second pillar, for example, which is money and credit, uh, becomes more prominent, of course, if you are in a lower bond uh, environment. The, uh, but the very last one is to say, has the economy sufficiently changed so that you have to revisit your uh, price stability object? I personally, I don't think, I don't see many reasons for that. Uh, I think uh, there are technical reasons like the lower bond, which deserves reflection. There is a question of financial stability, I agree. Uh, but I, I think the, uh, the framework has served us well uh, and uh, it will continue. But I even I look at the debate in the US about, you know what it leads, I mean the US, huh? it leads the bygone and not bygones, you know, so if you deviate, you have to go up. It may be useful, and I think Mario alluded to that in the, uh, e uh, the uh, speech, I think it was in the ECB and the Watchers, I think, or in a press conference, about the asymmetry. I will look at the asymmetry. So there was the idea that uh, the ECB, because of the 2%, you know, 2% is a ceiling of inflation. But it's a medium term. So n nobody ever said that you cannot overshoot the 2% because it's a medium term object. And we did it sometimes. And you have a, a medium term perspective. So you can overshoot at some point and undershoot at the other. What is at hand discussion in some circles is to say, uh, that you may, uh, the bygones are not bygones, you know, and that you have to compensate, you when you undershoot, you have to compensate later on. And that has to do with forward guidance on rates because you, your rates are at a zero level, so you have to make promises on the future, and how do you, how do you write that down? I just, I mean, I cannot, you know, in, in, in two, three minutes uh, go into all these arguments, but these are the things you have to be extremely careful when you go into that. Uh, the definition, the U.S. takes basically the PCE and not the CPI, for example. What about housing there? So there are a number of topics there you can, uh, that we should do as a normal business, I think, as central bank. But should you really, you know, <laughs> mediatize and say, we, well, we are going to have a strategic review. I think there I, I diverge indeed with, with many others. I think let's, let's think carefully about all that. These are serious issues, as I, I, I understand. But uh, let's not launch... Uh, where some people say 1% is okay. Why should you target close to 2%? Other people would say the bygones cannot be bygones. So we, when you undershoot for a while, you have to overshoot for a while. So it looks like price level targeting, but for possibly a limited period of time. Well, we have a framework which is medium term. We have to explain. Sometimes we undershoot. So we say we need to be patient and, uh, and, uh, and it goes on. Now, the more structural changes in our, in, our, in our economy, I think that's a key issue. So to what extent, when you have supply shocks, uh, you know, putting uh, a durable pressure on prices, you know, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that in your monetary policy framework? But all analysis so far show that these elements are relatively limited. But I mean, that, that is debatable, I agree. So we look forward to Sintra. You know, Sintra is the big central bankers meeting uh, in this is a nice place in Portugal, uh, where each uh, it's uh, public. Uh, it's public, so uh, yeah, you it's can follow it if you're not invited. But uh, yeah, so it's not a secret. <laughs> it's not a secret place. It's not an elite meeting, but it's a meeting of experts. <laughs> so, so now we have a uh, chance uh, to for some Q and A. Please, one, two. Yeah, please, madam. And I'd like, oh, yeah. I'd like to pick up on the trust point that you made. Oh, yes, very good. Um, because trust for institutions bypasses via accountability. Now, accountability means that people actually understand what you tell them. Yeah. And we have the Finnish presidency, future presidency, I think, in the room. They make a big point about well being. And my question is how can well being? be integrated into the central bank, at least communication. I'm not suggesting that it should be a, a, a kind of a point, but how can it be integrated into the communication? And 
should we think about not beyond GDP, because GDP is still you know, the thing we do, but the GDP plus element. This, I believe, with the uh, discussions that are programmed under the Finnish presidency will, will certainly be very relevant for policy makers mm -hmm. uh, and institutions. Would you see that find a role also in the, uh, in, in the communication and the thinking of the central banks? No, uh, no I think you, you presented well the, the point. I, I, I'm more um, narrow, mind, narrow mandate minded. Uh, I think the, uh, the, 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 the mandate is sound, sound money. Sound money means that you, know, you have to have a price expectation solidly anchored for the future, which is an element of reducing uncertainty. Uh, I think um, the question, the distributional issues usually, because that's really what's the main question, are not the main uh, issue for central banks. They should be dealt by, by the others. And uh, that's why I say that QE, which, uh, where you have more direct interventions in markets, create a specific issue. And then we, we try to explain, you know, that uh, the distributional effect, you know, there are pluses and minuses. And at the end of the day, if you can stabilize the economy, the pluses will dominate the minuses. Uh, but that's too short, because uh, if there are uh, severe distributional consequences, well, you go back to the politicians. I mean, because distributional issues have to remain uh, in, uh, by in politics. And that's why some people say, you know, that QE, uh, for central banks, when you go with the lower bound, it's not only a technical question, it becomes a political question, and that's the one we know, of course. And uh, now, I mean, to, get to, get to go back to normality in terms of interest rates, you know, you know first, it's, uh, it's the your sort of natural rate has to go up at some point. And, uh, and I think uh, Martin uh, mentioned that also, you know, this uh, productivity sort of pessimism that you have, plus the demography, putting you know, the uh, long-term growth down, which means that you are going to be confronted with relatively low real rates. We try to push the inflation expectations part, you know, a bit up, but with limited effects, of course, on the nominal rates. So that means uh, continuously confronted with the lower bound uh, in policy and this with the distributional issues uh, remain on the front because the balance sheet uh, of the central bank is likely to be used, you know, uh, in the next recession, probably, uh, with difficulties. So there is, there, there are that, that you see, what, what Eva said, you know, sh there are fundamental questions of central banking. I don't call it necessarily strategy for the uh, monetary policy strategy. I call it the central bank in policy making in general. And uh, it's true that the distribution consequence, if you think, you know, that uh, monetary policy supports, you know, asset prices and enriches some people, it belongs, as you know, to politicians to come up with uh, wealth taxes and other things, you know, that redistributes. And usually they don't want. That's why th this inflation debate in the past, you know, sometimes people say, well, the inflation was not bad, you know, unexpected inflation to some extent because, you know, it wipes out, you know, the real value of the debt. And there is a sometimes not nostalgia about this, you know, and uh, because they don't like to have the transparent debate about distribution. But I think the central bank should... That's the, if you look into supervision, I, I said the same actually. I said in supervision, I think it's very important for the central bank to have a very well informed about the situation of banks, I mean, in the financial system in general, because I would say the transmission mechanism uh, and the consequences of instability on the transmission mechanism. But once you put your finger in that, I mean, <laughs> everybody who may have the experience in supervision, it is another game. Uh, it's uh, many governors had troubles not because of their monetary policy, but very often, most often because of supervision issues. So it's another thing. You deal with property rights, we deal with, you know, creditor debtors problems, you know, and things like this. So, uh, of course, there is no s full separation, never. But still, I, I think once you go in supervision, you, you, you are more confronted with this in, in the perceptions of the public. So um, there's a lot of work. It's true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There is Mr. Nauschnik, I think, yeah. Peter, uh, two, two questions. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned this uh, question of devaluation, which reminded me of discussions we had in the 80s in the EFTA Economic Committee between us and the Swedes. We were, had fixed exchange rates, the Swedes uh, devalued. 
Uh, with hindsight, uh, we had a currency crisis which led to a banking crisis, and since that, Austria is richer than Sweden, so uh, our uh, fixed exchange rate strategy worked better than the Swedish uh, devaluation strategy. Uh, second question, you also mentioned yeah, the... No, it's not. A, no, it's, a, it's an example. It's an yeah. illustration. It's fine. And uh, second, uh, you mentioned this uh, question of a Troika. Of uh, the Troika. Troika. Ah, yes. uh, now we have a ESM working, we have a commission working. Shouldn't we try to get uh, as a ECB and the euro system out of a Troika? Because we have now the ESM, which is quite strong, it's functioning. Right. And uh, it would, uh, the political flag we get from being in the Troika would help us a lot. So if we get out of the Troika. That's I can that's be very purpose, frank because yeah. I retired yesterday. So <laughs> as a central banker, you. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm still in charge, so uh, I cannot <laughs> be, <laughs> a, few, a few more weeks I will, I don't think I will speak very differently, but uh, no, I mean, I, I agree with what you say. I, I think that's, that's, that's what we intend to do, that's what we say. I mean, it, it was never the Troika, we should have, we should, we should have maybe uh, <laughs> never used that term. Uh, for example, we used to sign uh, together com press communicate, you know, after a mission uh, with the IMF, you know, the Commission and the ECB, the same, the same level. I, now we say we are in liaison, we are in liaison, we bring some expertise and policy advice in, in the framework of our expertise, uh, but it's true that we have very often been part of a whole program where you deal with social security, minimum wage and, and things like this. And I think that's, that was uh, probably not good. And uh, and uh, that is being changed. I mean, this this is well well known. And uh, we all say we go in the framework of expertise. That means that we look at the financial sector. I think, I think in Spain, for example, uh, I think it was very useful. It was, it the the role as a central banker uh, was I think quite useful in the dialogue we had uh, with the Spanish authority at, at the time. For the others, I think it was the uh, unpreparedness you know, of the union for that sort of situation that led uh, ECB to be involved. But I think, as you say, I mean, things are evolving. Eh? It's, uh there is one question over there. Christian Keller from Barclays. Uh, uh, Peter, you you mentioned in, in, in your in your last uh, uh, section a bit, uh, you know, that structural factors could play a role, and there's some something for to debate there. Structural factors for uh, you, you for inflation. On, uh, you know, the the thought yeah, that there are now factors at play, structural factors that are driving trend inflation lower. Oh yes. Demographics, yeah. Yeah. globalization, technology, and that central banks could be in a position whereby they frantically try to reach a 2% inflation target while the trend is just pushing inflation yeah, lower. Yeah. Yeah. And those are factors that are beyond the control of the central bank. I, I just, you know, I don't think anyone has an answer to it, but I would love to hear a little bit your thoughts on that because this seems something, at least, you know, going out to clients talking about it, you know, when the question arises, why do central banks try so hard to reach 2% mm -hmm. when we may be in a state of good disinflation or good deflation? Yeah. No. It, it's something I find very, very, yeah. No, I uh, don't want to say too much. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Okay, okay. I just want to push you a little bit more on the question you started with, which was trust, and which was also being raised. So the question I have is, from your perspective, the ECB's trust is trust in what? So I think the answer you would want to give is the public, <laughs> no, you as the ECB, the public should trust in us to deliver our version of price stability. That's the only thing they should be willing to be able to trust in us. And, and provided we deliver that, we are trustworthy. And that's it. Um, and of course, um, people could then point out, with a few qualifications, you've delivered on that. 
So you should be trusted and there is therefore no problem. But isn't the reason that you think there's a problem, you've suggested there's a problem, is that isn't actually what the public at large wants to trust in you for, or not entirely. What they want is to believe that if you deliver price stability, which you promise, they will then experience a prosperous life, which I think is what the well-being question point is. And the simple truth is that though all that one Europe, one money stuff promised that if the ECB delivered price stability, you would all be prosperous, that's not how it worked no, out. No, no. Which means that in this wider sense, not only are you not trustworthy, you cannot conceptually be trustworthy, and you shouldn't even pretend that you can be, because that's not actually how the world works. That's, that's beautiful. No, that's very well said. Uh, but I, I, I allude a little bit to what you say. I mean, uh, when you ask, what is a central bank, <laughs> what is the responsibility of a central bank? So some people say it's uh, creating maximum employment uh, or prosperity in general. No, that's we provide sound money. And sound money is probably a necessary condition for prosperity, uh, but it's not a sufficient condition, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you can you influence the nominal, <laughs> the nominal environment, not the real environment. And uh, you know the the, the 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 important question you ask about: uh, Are you are you trying to achieve something that is unachievable? If you think about a succession of supply shocks, positive supply shock that pushes prices down, uh, you know China, let's say pushes down, so you try uh, continuously. We have a, uh, well, we, we, we think uh, yes, the answer remains yes, you can, but it's true at the end of the day, what you want to see is, is your policy creating uh, imbalances uh, that at some point you would say, fine, this policy, I don't reach it, because the collateral damage that you do by, because we don't know exactly, you know, the, the extent of the supply shock that you mentioned, and you, you try a policy that is creating imbalances and stresses somewhere, and then you say at some point you, you have to renounce. We don't see that, frankly. Uh, and uh, so you could say you, you, you do it. You know that your Phillips curve is quite flat, although it's moving. You say you need patience, you, know, you need persistence. It's coming. Uh, <laughs> and uh, don't forget that uh, those people saying you need a strategic, you know, uh, uh, st to think strategically, you destroy a little bit by sending that sort of message. Uh, the fact, because you say, ah, if you need a strategic you know, re uh, review, it's because you fail. Uh, immediately, when, uh, when uh, Oli mentioned a strategic, with all respect, because he's sitting on my left, and as you know now, you're on my right, Oli is on my left. And I say to Oli, it's fine, I also like you know, to think about our strategy. Uh, but uh, be careful about the signal you sent, because people say, it's because you fail. Uh, what I say uh, here is, I don't think it fails. We had a number of shocks that came recently, again. Uh, I mean, you cannot just say the policy, you know, your inflation expectations are relatively weak, other things being equal. We had new shocks uh, recently. I mean, I just mentioned the Brexit and, and the number of the trade protectionism and all that. So you, 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 if the environment would have been the same, you know, and you say, ah, you don't reach it, okay, maybe. But we had new shocks there. Be, be careful about concluding that the things have to be fundamentally re revisited. But, but you're right, you, have to, you cannot just ignore these things. No, the, the, the answer, as I say, it's imbalances. If you think that it creates major imbalances, and some people here in the room will say, yes, you create major imbalances, financial imbalances and things like this, then of course the, the, these people will say you need at some point to change your policy fundamentally. If you don't think, uh, then, then it's another conclusion, of course. We, our conclusion at this stage, you say, no, it doesn't. The the uh, the uh, the balance, of course, is still that uh, you know patient's persistence has to continue. So thank you know you that the I'm, I'm afraid I think uh, we should uh, end this, this. It's a bit late now, uh, and uh, oh yes. and uh, I think uh, <laughs> your presentation was very interesting. So we still have a number of questions, but perhaps this can be done on a personal pr uh, basis.